I was thrilled to be here to, um, to talk to Sophie Pish. She is uh, probably Cambodia's best known contemporary artist. His work has been exhibited around the world in major galleries and biennales in Asia, Europe, United States and Australia. Um, so Pip was born in Cambodia in 1971, which means that his childhood uh, was during those really murderous years of the Pol Pot regime. And we'll be hearing, I guess, a little bit about whether that has left its imprint on So Pip and how that might manifest itself Did in his work. That? Yes. Yeah? His family eventually escaped Cambodia by foot uh, because they lived not far from the Thai border. So they escaped by foot and uh, ended up living in refugee camps in Thailand for a number of years before finally being accepted by the United States as refugees. So, so Peep, you landed in uh, the US at the age of 13. That must have been quite a culture shock for you. Yes, it was. <laughs> what was it like? What were your first impressions? Um, we landed in the summer uh, of 1984. So I did have about two months to kind of watch everybody before I had to jump into it. Um, I started school in seventh grade, and so that right there was a bit of a, a tricky thing. Uh, I was in school before uh, when I was in the camps, but it was in a Cambodian school, and in a Cambodian school they taught us um, <laughs> mathematics and writing. So when I went to the U.S., I have, what, four more courses. So that was also very tricky, and uh, I didn't understand the teacher's uh, English. That was the trouble I had, but I could read a little bit, so I could follow. So. Because your father had taught you a little bit of English. Yes, yeah, my father was very, very smart. He, uh, when we got to the camp in uh, 1979, he started learning English for about uh, a year and a half. And uh, because there were some people who knew English and then they taught it out of their, their room, basically, their, their, their huts. So he went to take that and then Basically, after about a, a year of that, he started teaching for free, everybody around him, basically all the relatives and everybody. I could speak, I could understand, but uh, I didn't understand the grammar or anything like that. Um, so for me, it was just the right time. Mm. You know, um, they put me in seventh grade knowing that I might do okay. Mm. So it was still very difficult for you to fit in, though, into Absolutely, yeah. this new Absolutely, I mean, country. I went to Amherst, Massachusetts, and it's, uh, it's known as a five-college uh, area. And so it's supposed to be diverse, but it's only diverse in the school year and in the summer there's uh, very few people that are not my color. So it was a bit difficult, um, a bit difficult growing up, you know, uh, someone who doesn't un understand how to dress, how to walk, how to talk, you know, stuff like that. Yeah. 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 So you went to high school and you went to college and you studied fine arts. Uh, you studied painting. Now tell me about the first painting you remember seeing. Well, uh, the first painting I remember seeing was in the camps, wasn't in, uh, wasn't in school, um, back when I was uh, 10 years old or something. Uh, it was uh, done by a, a neighbor, you know, friend, a uh, neighbor, um, and uh, it was a landscape, a uh, Cambodian landscape. And uh, I remember that painting for the rest of my life, just a small little watercolor. And, uh, in fact, when I was in school, I wanted to be uh, what my father wanted me to be, which was what he wanted to be, he was a doctor. So um, he did everything he could to uh, steer me away from any art at all. Uh, my, I love my father. He's an amazing person. He's got his own history that uh, many people will, will never believe. But one of the things he told me to, to, to not do in school was to take art. <laughs> well, not, to not, to, to not just not take, but not be in life uh, was to be an artist a writer, a musician, a philosopher, and a couple others, I can't remember. But, Why was he so opposed to that? Uh, I guess, you know, growing up in the way, he, the life that he lived um, uh, would be obvious to him that those things are not useful. Um, so, <laughs> uh, my father was a monk. Um, uh, that's how he's got his uh, 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 education. And then the, he was an assistant to uh, a nurse. And so he became a nurse during the Lano uh, period, which is uh, the pre-70s uh, period. And uh, he was uh, actually a, um, a nurse uh, for the army. 
in, 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 in his way of understanding uh, the world is, is that uh, one, you become a monk, and two, you become a doctor. And uh, you'll be okay if you can get those two things correct, you know? And uh, I didn't become any of that. <laughs> Which he regretted for a long time, for a long time. Yeah. Uh, um, but he forgave me now. Yeah. yeah. Oh, thank goodness for that. <laughs> but, he, but he actually taught you a lot of things. He did, Your yeah. father. Uh, which, of course, has come back in your artwork these days. Um, but perhaps we'll talk about that a little later. I, I, I wanted to um, just follow very briefly the little biography, you know. So you, so you, you studied um, art at I studied pre-med. I studied pre-med up until I had to finally say to myself, I can't be a doctor, uh -huh. which was a junior year in, high, in, uh, in college. Then I, I switched to art. You switched to art. Yeah. But you'd known. Was it since you saw that first painting that knew you, you knew you wanted to be I an knew, artist? but I, I tried to lie to myself. Yeah. You know. yeah. <laughs> if I were good at, at medicine, I would never give up. <laughs> but I just, you know, I didn't, I didn't, no, yeah. it wasn't for me. Yeah. Mm. And then eventually, you, uh, well, you become an artist, you graduate, you become an artist. It was very tough for you um, in America. Yes. And eventually you, do, you made the decision to go back to Cambodia. So what prompted that decision? There was a bunch of circumstances that happened, uh, but I think uh, I live in my head most of the time. And uh, what my head meaning is uh, I'm always living with this memory uh, of my childhood. And uh, I, just, I just think there was something in there that can come out in some way. And I wasn't willing to just put on another coat and uh, become somebody just by prescription. I, I wanted to, there was something else, you know, inside. And, uh, uh, but at the same time, I had a rough life in, in Massachusetts, you know, after I graduated for two years. I don't know, I didn't have the right friends, I didn't live in the right city, who knows. And uh, finally, I just said, uh, I in gotta what, go, in I gotta go back. In what way was it rough? What, hmm? what do you mean it was a rough life? It, um, you can't be an artist uh, when your parents are living in, uh, uh, in a government subsidized home and uh, working in a factory 15 hours a day, six days a week. You know, that's overtime plus regular time uh, to, to, make, to make a living. Um, it's, it's, the guilt is, is, is impossible to, uh, to handle. Um, and I myself, I was working in different jobs that were just completely meaningless and I was going crazy. Mm. And so I drank too much and I smoked too much. And, well, I continued that, but, uh, <laughs> but it helped me, you know, when I found the right place to be. Yeah. So, you know, the story was that I, I was working as an interpreter and, um, and so I had to drive all the time everywhere and I'm a horrible driver. I don't know directions. I can't tell you left, right. You don't right, fit a so. terrible stereotype here. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm lost all the time on the highway. And yeah. one time my friend called me up. She said, uh, where are you? I said, I'm on the highway. She said, oh, are you lost? I said, yeah, well, of course I'm lost. I'm, you know, I'm always lost. She said, well, do you know why? She says, and I, I said, I don't know. I'm not good with directions. She says, no, because you should be in Cambodia. Yeah. And uh, she knew, I mean, she was very spiritual. <laughs> and so on the way back, the same day, on the way back home, uh, driving back into Boston, I, um, uh, I, I listened to college radio and um, there was a Cambodian rock song that was on. And I, I just, I, I almost cried. I just said, well, if this is not a sign, I don't, I don't know what, you know. They play one song and they say, this is a new album that they just found. It's called Cambodian Rocks. Some of you might know it. And they played this amazing song, and uh, I said, I gotta get back because if, if Cambodia is coming to America now on the radio, then it must be okay, you know. <laughs> so I bought a plane ticket two weeks later, and I, I was gone. Right. So 2004. 2002. You, yeah. 2002, yeah. you went back to Cambodia. Yeah. Another culture shock, I imagine. Yeah. yeah. What did your father think about you going back? They hated the idea. Yeah. They, hated, they, 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 they were scared for me because I had beard, I had long hair. I, <laughs> You know, I, was, uh, I wasn't looking right, you know. And uh, so they told me, finally, you know, they asked me a lot of questions. I can't remember all of them, but um, finally they just said, okay, fine. If you want to go back, please just change your glasses, cut your hair, and shave your beard. <laughs> and, uh, and find some new clothes. Um, he said that if you're going back as an artist, you're going to have a hard time because, uh, you know, the country is not ready for you. Uh, they want help. They need help. They need people that are going to be beneficial for them. And... And uh, I'm sorry to say, but art is not it, you know? And I, 
it's almost believe him. My man didn't care, but uh, I, I, I thought he had his reason. Um, but when I came back, I fell in love with the country. It was completely broken. It's nothing like now. If you go now, it's, you wouldn't you wouldn't see what I saw in 2002. It was people were people were taking baths outside their uh, balcony. You know, uh, and I live on the third floor. It was it was romantic. <laughs> I can't describe it any other way, I think. Mm. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. You mentioned a little bit about your childhood memory being strong. Mm. And I'm thinking you were very, very young then. What could you possibly have remembered? Why? I remember everything. So? Yeah? Yeah. I remember everything. Because I have all the time to remember. Um, I didn't have distraction. I, every day was current to me. You know what I mean? Like I had nothing, nothing to block me. Everything I saw. I live every day, so I move around, I live in fear, I live in hunger, I live in... I still smell the food, you know? You know how when you're so hungry and then you eat for the first time, I remember exactly what that smelled like. I remember... I remember, and my mother would come to see me in Cambodia and she tells these stories and say, yeah, of course I remember that, I remember that. And I tell her and she was amazed. Mm. I remember things before I was three. And she doesn't believe it. Yeah. Yeah, she doesn't believe it. Yeah. But I believe, I, 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 yeah. yeah. Pretty amazing. Yeah. So, I mean, all, all those things, I think, were part of the things that was pulling me. You know, I didn't know it, but it was part of the things that were pulling me back. Yeah. Mm. So we're back in Cambodia. You were still painting at this yeah. point. Yeah. But you started to experiment with other art forms. Yes, I started taking photographs yeah. because it was easy. Yeah. yeah. But, uh, but I'm very no, fascinated really, to hear about how you went from that to this beautiful work that we see mm. here, uh, making sculpture with rattan. How did mm. you come to this form? I, uh, I was desperate. I, uh, nothing I made at the time mean anything to me. Uh, I felt like after I made it, it was empty. After I made it, it was empty. And uh, it didn't feel like it was mine. It didn't feel like it was part of me. It felt like always uh, this struggle. and. Uh, I said, when is this going to end, you know? And so, it wasn't like I knew what I was going to do. It was uh, an accident as well. Um, I, I said, well, I'm smoking too much and I'm drinking too much and I, I think that's going to affect my liver and my lungs. And uh, so I started to think my body, I started to think of, of my inside and... Uh, so that pre-med training didn't go to waste. It didn't. You that much. It didn't, it didn't, yeah, it didn't. <laughs> and uh, I started making a pair of lungs and... I asked around, I said, how am I going to do this? Uh, somebody else maybe can do it for me. But I wasn't, because I was trained in the US, I knew that people hire other people to do their art. And, um, <laughs> and then the reality was, I didn't have any money. And I didn't uh, have any skill. So a big, a big problem, you know. Um, then there was a rattan shop just across the street. They make rattan chairs and couches and baskets and whatnot. So oh, so you mean your original sculpture was going to be like a stone sculpture? Yeah, right? yeah. I don't so know. You typically, skills, you know, yeah. typically um, stone was heavy and expensive and wood and yeah. you need chisels and all that. Yeah. So I just bought some rattan and I said I'm just going to make it out of rattan real quick, and so that I can cover it with cigarette cigarette packages. You know, symbolizing the, idea. the smoking. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> right. And um, so I did it. I tried to do that. Um, and then the French Cultural Center director uh, came to see me before I finished with the completely uh, covering it with cigarette uh, packages. And he told me uh, that it was the most modern sculpture I've ever seen in Cambodia. And I should really look at it before I decide to cover it all up. So it took me a while. I had, to, I had some debate with people, with my girlfriend at the time, with myself. And, and finally, I thought he was right. So I, I kept it that way. And, um, and uh, well, he respected that, and he liked that, and he gave me uh, some assistance to, to continue. So that's how my life changed. So that was the first piece of contemporary sculpture in Canada. He claimed. I, I didn't. I don't know. <laughs> It's pretty I good. hope he's right. Yeah, yeah. Okay, well, we'll go with that. We're, we're happy to go with that, aren't we, Jean? Yes, yeah. So that was the beginning. That was, yeah. Yeah, yeah. and looking at it, uh, at your work, it's so um, intricate. Mm. And uh, we were chatting yesterday about that very first piece you made. And because you were going to cover it over mm. and you were working in a hurry, mm -hmm. 
you actually just sort of whacked it together. I wing didn't it, you? yeah. I did it in a day or two. Yeah. 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 I didn't have time anyway. Just didn't and you have said you time. were cutting up the bits of rattan on a cutting board. In on the a kitchen. cutting board with a, with, a, with a butcher knife and, a, and an axe. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I didn't know how to tear the rattan. My assistant now, they tear the rattan beautifully and they shave it beautifully. I yeah. didn't know what to do. I just, yeah. 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 But this idea of, of making things. Um, mm of using your hands. Mm. This is something that harks back to the influence of your father. Exactly, yeah. Can you tell yeah. us about that? My father really, all his life, trying to mold me into the person that he, he, he is and he couldn't be. He became a metalsmith during the Khmer Rouge, and uh, I would help him make things, um, you know, filing a spoon. My, my father was the, 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 uh, the village um, uh, hardware person, mm. the village metalsmith. Uh, we, we made buckets, kettles, pots, spoons, you know, the Chinese soup spoons out of tin, out of aluminum. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, we even casted our first spoon. We casted spoon, yeah, making a, you know, these things you have to make the mold. So you have to carve the wood to make the negative and the positive and uh -huh. to put, the, to put the, to, to, the, the, the aluminum there and you have to hammer it. So you do all this thing and uh, it wasn't like you get a mold and you make and you just press it. No, you have to carve it out and stuff. So. I did what I could, being so young and little. I'm a small, small boy at the time. Yeah. I think it just, you know, it brings back joy in, in, the, uh, in making objects. But your point about being it, uh, it being, um, what is it, a meticulous or crafty yeah. or something? Yeah, yeah, um, meticulous work yeah. In, in, in your work these days. You know, days. I, I did that because I just didn't know, I didn't think I had any ideas. So if I'm going to make something, I better make it well because if they're looking at ideas, they're not going to find anything. So if they're looking at the work, at least they can say, well, it's well done. <laughs> no, honestly, that's how I thought. Yeah. I still think that. Yeah. Yeah. It saves me. <laughs> that's why I don't get too complicated. You see, you, know, you see the work is very simply made. So your first sculpture was a, a, a set of lungs. Yeah. And in fact, a lot of the early work looks a lot like Body parts, internal yeah. organs. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I think one of my favorite pieces is a a womb. Yes, it? the womb, the echo, yeah. Yeah, yeah that, that echo piece is a second version. People like that piece so much. I wasn't particularly crazy about it, but people liked it so much, I made three of them. <laughs> in different years, because they said, oh, come on, just make one, just make one more. I said, oh, okay, I'm poor, you know, I'll do it. <laughs> when you make a piece, can you, can you run us, I don't, I don't want, need a step-by-step -step how to make mm. sort of thing, but I'm just interested in the process of how mm. the thing is, is done, because I imagine, I wonder how the idea and the shape and the form of the work changes as it's being made. Right. Uh, the process is very slow. This is why I have a lot of assistance now because um, the labor that goes into preparing the rattan and the bamboo is very, very slow, very time consuming. The bamboo we used to go out and cut ourselves uh, because, uh, well, because I didn't know they sell bamboo that I could use. And anyway, my guys always wanted to go cut the bamboo because it's it's a time that we don't spend in the studio, you know. <laughs> but the rattan, we, we order it from uh, uh, basically a middleman, and it floats down from up north, the river. And uh, you split it, and then you boil it in oil, in diesel oil, diesel gasoline, um, 20 minutes each time. And, uh, and then you split it. It's, it's very tough. It's very tough to, to work with the hand. I can't do it now. Because I, I, I do the butcher knife thing, it will take forever. And so I have a group of guys that just sit there and just do that. That's how they learn. That's like an apprentice mm. stage, you know. Mm. So there's only a couple of guys that are actually making the things with me. The rest of the guys are really doing the preparation. And you come up with your idea, the shape, the form? Oh, it's, you know, um, it just comes. I don't know. I read, I, read, I, I read books. Sometimes I dream about it. Sometimes it just comes. And sometimes it came 10 years ago and it's just coming now, you know to real life, you know. Um, I doodle it, I write it down. You know, what do artists do? Be interesting to have a program called, what do artists do? <laughs> I used to ask my friends who were so much smarter than me, how do you get your ideas? And they tell me what I'm telling you right now. <laughs> we sit around. <laughs> That's not that simple. But, I don't uh, think so. Know. I think you're making it a little simple. Yeah. But you were saying the other day that artists always struggle with their materials. Yes, I think the material fights you all the time. Uh, painters will tell you that, sculptors will tell you the same. I, I happen to love the material because it, it's something very, uh, very physical about it. I love the smell of it, I love the bending of it. 
I love the way it fights me. I love the way it listens to me. Uh, I love the way it doesn't want to do what I want it to do. So it changes the shape that I, that, you know, I wanted to make it this way, but it doesn't want to be that way. So, uh, and then through that new little new little technique uh, uh, happens, and uh, if it seems reasonable to keep, you keep it. If it's not, you don't. You know. Um, so my steps are very small. They're very incremental, but they're very small. I go backward, forward. I don't have any t sense of time with my work. Mm. Technique's the same. Uh, I keep it the grid. I keep it very simple. The wire is very efficient. Uh, we tie it just one way. There's not too many ways unless it needed to be. Chances are it doesn't. To tie a grid together, you only need to do it a couple of ways. And if you do it right, you do it right, and it's the strongest. That's what we want. If you do it this way, this way, this way, then it bends. If you do it this way, then this way, then it stays the same. So it kind of... You know, uh, it's, it's, it, it's not a very strong material by itself, but all together it's very strong. It's very hard to break them. Yeah. Hard to destroy, I try it many times. Mm. Yeah. <laughs> Unless you take a knife or a scissor and cut yeah. it, you cannot destroy it. Yeah. Did you willfully try and destroy it? Were you I, frustrated with a piece? Uh, that, yes, at one yeah. point I was. Uh, I was making big sculpture because, again, I don't have ideas, so sculptures tend to just get bigger and bigger. <laughs> I just wait, you know, because... Uh, if I make small things, it means I need to make, need to make so many works a, a year. But uh, I don't have so many ideas, so I make big things. <laughs> no, it's true. It's really true. And at that point in my life, I was very poor. And when I started making these sculptures, you know, on the one hand, I found a sense of um, freedom, a sense of independence, and, and a kind of love for the material and for art, you know. But at the same time, nobody understood it. So... People say, well, I could buy your paintings, but I, I said, I'm not painting anymore. And uh, they say, well, I don't know then. You know, I don't know what to do. And uh, so I stood on a rooftop, and I had to move around a few times. And, um, and finally I said, well, it's going to die up there anyway. I might as well help it, you know. So I tried to burn it. It wouldn't burn. Mm. Yeah. I've been reading about, uh, since you talk about big sculptures, I've been reading about a big um, sculptural installation that you did originally mm. for the... Um, Singapore Biennale, yes. called Compound. Yes. And I'm interested in this because um, your memories, your childhood memories and your history um, is, is a part of your work, but you're a contemporary artist. And I was curious to know what are the contemporary concerns that, that show themselves in your work. And um, I believe in this one, there is sort of the link between the past and the present. Uh, mm. Can you tell us a little bit about what drove that, that work? Because it's recently been shown again in Seattle and, and in New York earlier Because it's, it's too big, nobody wants it again. All right. But, and, and, uh, yeah. Um, when I made the, an installation for APT, uh, uh, 2009, APT. The Asia Pacific Triennial. Asia Pacific Triennial in, Triennial in Queensland. Right. Yeah. Um, uh, I made uh, a group of uh, sculpture that basically chronicle a brief history of, of my life, like basically in 1979 at the, at the fall of the Khmer Rouge. We travel from the Khmer Rouge village back to the, the Barambang, the center, the, the provincial, the town center, where all the economics and the, the big buildings were. So we live always in a farm, so we walk. And uh, it took us about, I don't know, five days, seven days, something like this. And I saw a lot of just a lot of things in the landscape, a lot, of, a lot of dead people, a lot of dead cows and animals and tanks and airplane parts and so all this stuff, this war stuff. So when they invite me to do the a APT, I, I say, well, I should do something of my own, you know, something personal because or else uh, no one's going to see me, you know. So they need a story or something. That's what I thought. Um, and I started making bombs and, and bomb shapes and, and things like that. So part of that sculpture is bomb shapes. A part of, uh, of it is uh, cubes and uh, cubes uh, because it's a challenge to make cubes this way, you know, to build a, a cube, mm. to make it uh, perfect and so that they sit together well, so that they fit together in a straight line. It's very difficult to do. So those are the two ideas. So at the same time, I was interested in the challenge of making a cube. Um, not to show a cube, but to perhaps possibly have an idea around it. And then these bomb shapes. And I was working on this uh, installation, just finished the installation. And then I thought, oh, bombs and buildings. So I put the two together. That's how that sculpture come about. So bombs to symbolize destruction and buildings to symbolize building and progress and cities and 
civilizations and I don't think it's a very well, well formulated idea, but I think if, again, if I make it big enough, people will be drawn to it. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's clearly worked. Yeah. You know, people keep showing it. I hope so. I hope so. <laughs> <laughs> well, one of the biggest pieces in this um, exhibition is the Buddha. Mm. And um, of course, you know, Angkor Wat's probably the most famous your tourist attraction. It's in our flag, yes. It's yeah. Just, uh, yeah. And so I'm wondering, is there a place, what, what, what is the place of spirituality in, in your work? Why Buddha? Oh, it isn't Buddha. Um, it isn't Buddha. No, no, not at all. I, I, I think my, my space for spirituality is, uh, is silence, is working in, in quiet. That's, that's where I think if it exists at all in me, it's, it's there. It's when I'm working. Um, it's that battle between the, the, the work. That's where spirituality is for me. I don't have any sense of religion or anything like this. Philosophy is another thing, but uh, you know, I also read up on different philosophers and, and things like that. But um, actually, the Buddha was born out of that installation I was telling you about for APT. Uh, the loose strand Buddha uh, happened because um, after I make all these bombs and and a few other you know things in, in the landscape, I said this is still not enough. I don't know. I need something else. I need something to conclude this story because if it's just a bunch of things straying around, don't doesn't do anything. So I thought about the end of that journey where my family, my father mainly, decided to settle uh, down uh, in front of a temple. We go through the temple ground every day and, um, and even if we go into the ground, of the, uh, we go into the temple itself, uh, uh, the sala, um, which is the, the temple hall where people chant and pray and all that. And, but we walk in there and we, meaning me and my cousin at the time, and there was all these blood stains, you know, on the temple walls and splattering everywhere. It was like a white room with all these stains on it. Mm -hmm. And um, yeah, that memory never left me. Um, that temple is, is shut. I don't know if they repainted or what, but it's a very old, old temple. It's still there, still standing, but it's, it's, they closed the door to that temple hall. Um, so I thought to symbolize my, the end of that journey with that end of the journey, which is the temple. And, uh, and I thought I couldn't build a temple, I couldn't do a sculpture of a temple and just put some paint on it, it just didn't make any sense. So I thought the Buddha was a perfect example, a perfect icono iconographic uh, symbol for the temple. And so I started with the head and then I come down to the shoulder and I thought, oh, I think this is my Buddha, you know, this is my Buddha. So the stand still stays loose and I said, this is still not enough, it needs something. So. I said, you know, I wanted to do the blood. I wanted to just put a little blood in there. So I dipped, I dipped the ending, the strand, the strand of the, the ending of the strand about this long. Uh, I dip it in um, uh, India ink, red India ink. And I hung it on the wall and it was perfect. Mm. You know, it was just, wow. You know, I couldn't believe it. Yeah. And uh, it was one of those moments, like, mm. uh, like everything has opened up. And then, um, I thought, okay, this is interesting. And uh, some years, a couple of years later, I thought, well, I've done my own Buddha. Why don't I do another person's Buddha, you know, and see what happens? And uh, so I just, you know, I used to live uh, above uh, from an artist uh, who sells uh, sculptures uh, of the Buddha and other sculptures. So I bought one and it's in my room. And I said, well, what's wrong with making a copy of a copy? And then just, <laughs> you know, just see, like, just see what happens, you know? And so. And it's, it, it's very disciplined. You have to really make it right, you know, because you can't kind of make it up because it's there in front of you and uh, everybody knows that's how it looks. Yeah. So, so, yeah, it became a very big thing because my, my ceiling was only allowed to me to make it that big. So that's why it was that tall. It could uh -huh. have been bigger. <laughs> <laughs> and, and fortunately, you were able to move it out. <laughs> exactly. Yes, yes, yes. Yeah. No problem. Yeah. 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 And I would hope now that you are so successful, your, your, your father's changed his mind about whether it was a good idea you, or not you know, for you the, to be an artist. The first show I had in the US, I didn't ask them to come because I think there was nothing for them to really see. And, uh, and it was my big show, but I didn't ask them to come. And then the second show, because, of the, because I had some success after that, and then the second show I said, oh, mom, dad, you should come. You know, you should come. I fly you over, I put you up in a nice hotel, you come. So they came and uh, they love it, yeah. They love the Buddha, mainly. If, it wasn't, if the Buddha wasn't there, I think it was. Uh. It would have been like, when is the Buddha coming? You know? So uh, from that on, time on, I think they, they're very happy. Yeah. Different people now. Yeah. Yeah. All right, well, I think we, um, 
we need to have some questions from the audience. I wanted to leave some room because I'm sure you have lots of questions for Sophie. And he's, he's open to it. He said, bring it on. Bring it on. So, um, <laughs> so if, if you do have a question for him, please. Oh, here we go. Yeah. I was wondering, uh, your time in the US before you went back to Cambodia, did you have an experience with kind of the, the art scene there? Did you explore Western art in any way? Did it influence, influence your practice at all? Well, as I said, I studied in school, so I went to Chicago, you know, for grad school. I was so far behind that um, I didn't know what I was supposed to do, but my teacher always pushed me to do things that I should have done, right? So uh, I went to Chicago because I was from Amherst, and he said, my, one of my teachers said, New York would be too much for you. But Chicago would be a good school because there's a big body of students, and you can make friends, and, but the best thing is that there's a museum just across the street, and so you will see a lot of art. And um, yeah, I love reading up on artists. I'm a big fan of artists. I, I'm so much a big fan, I had to work in the library. <laughs> and you wouldn't believe I take so many books out, and I just spend all my time looking up other people's work, and I still remember them. And uh, later on, after school, I, I travel, and I said, oh yes, I know this guy, I know that guy. Mm -hmm. Even though I've never seen his work before, except in the books. You know, so I was continually inspired by artists. That is one thing. Yeah. Loved your exhibition at the APT, and also I've ah. seen images of the New York Metropolitan Show, mm. which was wonderful. So congratulations. No, only on the internet. Oh, no. <laughs> but I wanted to ask you, um, we, you've talked about uh, keeping the traditional arts alive and about the contemporary art scene, but what's the attitude in Cambodia to artists who might want to depict memories of the more recent past? There was another artist exhibiting in Documenta, Avan, I've just forgotten his Van name. Van yes. I brought him there. Yes, yeah. so there are artists who are depicting life under the Khmer Rouge mm -hmm. uh, in Cambodia, mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. how is that viewed in Cambodia? Well, the thing with art is always very tricky, right? I mean, uh, Van Nath is an extraordinary artist. You know, uh, I look up to him very highly, and uh, I wanted him in my in my exhibition. I mean, I want him in my room. You know, I want his work in the room, and uh, so we worked that out somehow with the director. She loved that too because I took her when she came to see me. I took her to see Van Nath and his studio, and so we discussed about that for about six months. And um, there isn't many artists like him. You know, there isn't many artists. You know what I mean? Um, there are people who 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 loves being an artist, who loves painting, and they paint, but there isn't enough of the serious stuff. I mean, Van Nath was a serious stuff. Sly Ken, you might know his work, a self-taught painter. He was a serious stuff, you know, and, and he's appreciated. So it's a, like I said, it's a tricky thing, but if you do it in a way that, that, that people cannot escape, in a way, right? This is you, you are, this is what you do. Eventually you, you get recognized or you get appreciated.